I am having a very special day. So hence the Vino Tinto and it's another Mark and Chums episode. And on this particular occasion the tables have been turned. Because today's guest is Andrew Kay. I've done three shows with Andrew over the years. Two as Ho Ho Ho. One when I was actually doing something for the pork burger. And that was called Cook It. But today we're in graciously allowed us into his flat with Willow, who you'll be seeing later, the cat, who's 19, me, glass of vino, tin two or nine, I might bug out for a fag. So here we go. It's the Andrew K. Here he is. Andrew K, thank you so much. For allowing me to come into your beautiful, if if I may so so, highly decorated. Yes, yeah, some people say it's over decorated. I have one friend who says I don't know how you can live like that. Don't they often? They often I have two friends who say that. They just think it's all clutter. Well, that's the word people say. Well, how can you live with all that clutter? And I don't think it's clutter at all. I mean, everything on the walls has a story. Mm. Uh, everything on the shelves has a story. I'm just surrounded by things I love. I mean. I can't bear this whole minimal thing. It's like, apart from anything else, I'm too untidy to be minimal. There's uh, nothing as you can see. Yeah. Well, no, you worry about this place. This is, t in comparison to my mind, looks like a shithole. <laughs> oh, you're, by the way, you're allowed to swear in these. <laughs> Aren't we, dear? Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, my, uh, honestly, it's a dump, but I live in Moleskine, but this is very posh and very nice, very colourful and all that. And what I want to say is, the, as I've said in my intro, the roles are now reversed. I know, it's very odd for me to be on this side of the camera uh, in this role. I have been interviewed a couple of times before, mm. but it's sort of, it's not normal for me to be here. And, well, it's, and it's very weird because I've not had to do any research for this, which is great. You could just research your life. I'm sure things will pop out of your grey matter like no one's business at all. But I remember what happened was I was invited before we met several years ago, and you were doing for latest TV, which is the local radio, um, radio or the television station, yes. um, a show called Cook It. That's right. My great love is cooking, food and drink. Mm -hmm. And I watch a lot of food on television. And in my past, I designed a lot of food books. Mm -hmm. um, but I was becoming really aware of the fact that the food being cooked on television, on the whole, was restaurant food. It was the sort of food that you go out and eat, not the sort of food that you pop in the kitchen at tea time and say, oh, what can I make for dinner? And I wanted to do something that reversed that whole thing. So it was about what's in the fridge, what's in the cupboard, mm. and what so you're can not I do with it. you're not supposed to open a can of beans or something like that. Yeah, well, we all like a can of beans on toast from yeah, time whatever. to time, you know. Uh, but it was all about building up uh, we, we had a huge dispute at the time. You were asked to come on by a, a mutual friend called David, and David said I couldn't use the word larder or pantry because people wouldn't know what they were. And I said, well, that's because people don't have them anymore. Mm. They have fitted kitchens and cupboards. But a pantry or a larder is where you store all the basics that you need. And so every week on the series we had a five pound budget to stock a pantry or larder, mm. which was great. And we started with absolute essentials and moved on so that we had in the cupboard enough to make a meal, even if you hadn't mm. had time to go out and buy a couple of lamb chops. And it was, it was great, it was great fun because we always had a sort of audience. It was a bit bonkers having an audience to do that sort of show. Mm. And you came along and I think you made burgers with us. I made, um, I can't remember what, I can't remember how many episodes there were, but there was what the particular one I was in, and we brought our chum David Rommel along to, mm -hmm. who, who we had to toss a coin, who was going to be in vision, but he was yes. in the background, and luckily I won. <laughs> uh, and we made with, you made the most superb, and I still have, as Mrs Bridget was saying upstairs, downstairs, I still haven't had the receipt. Uh, uh, what was it? Coastal. Oh, your coastal, yes. Your, your wonderful pearl, and it was beautiful. I mean, mm -hmm. I tell you what, I could eat it all again. 
but we made pork burgers and That's I was right. I was chopping up red ch I can't remember who the chef was, I think he was up at he was Seven from Dials or something. Seven Dials and it's now gone that restaurant. It was a great burger restaurant mm. that has sadly disappeared. Um, but he was good and hey he actually stepped in to do that at the last minute on that morning. Well I think I stepped in as and well. And I think you came in at a sort of last minute. I think it was but the it day was before. A, it was one of those days when everything was in plan and you're woken up by a text message at six in the morning from a chef saying, I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to be able to do it. And I've got the camera crew and the sound and I've got I think my I was, friend I Laura think I, and the audience yeah, coming along. I, I think I was asked about eight o'clock that evening. And the venue booked and so on. Well, this was the, the morning after that. Mm. And it was like, what the hell do you do? I mean, everything's in place apart from this damned chef. Who I'm not going to name, um, but it was annoying. And fortunately, my friend Andrew, who owned the restaurant, mm. I sent him a message. I did actually wait to a lot more dignified time than mm. six a.m. in the morning, <laughs> uh, and he stepped in and found a chef for me. I've always been absolute because if I had been an actor by trade, and I trained as a nurse, as you know, yes, um, I would have been a chef. Because I love my passion, like you, is food. food or cooking for people. I love yeah. cooking for people. That's and what would happen is, easy. <laughs> hold on a moment, come here. Here's Willow. Oh. There you are, Willow. You sit there. This is Willow. It's nineteen. Can you get Willow in there? Watch down there, Willow, because you might let him in tights. Amongst <laughs> other things. So. She'll love you for my, life, you know. But what happened was, my father opened a couple of, one in Mallorca and one in Whitstable, and can open some restaurants. Brilliant combination. We Absolutely. And uh, 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 in, um, the one in Mallorca was in Calador, which originally yeah. was one bar. It's now huge. You're going to just sit down, that's it. And when I saw what the chef had to do in my youth, I didn't want my passion for cooking to turn into a chore yes so i, I thought no that. and i know how much probably why um, the chef on that particular occasion doing your show didn't turn up he probably had a bad night and didn't get to bed until probably four in the morning i mean it's a bit of a grim life but i've i've sort of done it i've um, when i left school i went to the channel islands i went to guernsey and i took a little tiny tent and slept one night in the tent on the campsite and the next day bought the local paper and looked through the jobs and found a job for a waiter mm. in a hotel called Hotel the Douvre, mm -hmm. that the locals called the Douvres. And um, I went on for an interview and it was the most bizarre place. I mean, it couldn't have been more like 40 Towers. If you but tried. that's the best though, isn't it? It was brilliant. And the owner was an extraordinary youngish man called... This is Guernsey. Guernsey mm. was occupied by the Germans in mm. World War II. Mm -hmm. He was called Mark Hess. Okay. And he was German. And his wife, uh, Ginny, was just divine. She was such a lovely person. Mark was a bit mad, a bit strange. Anyway, I got the job as a waiter. But part of the job was you did so many breakfast, lunch and dinner services. You did so many uh, shifts as the barman mm. in the guest's bar, not in the public bar, and you did so many shifts as commie chef, which was brilliant. It was great because I basically worked when the guests were having meals, apart from a couple of days, and mm. then I was behind the bar with the guests buying me drinks, or in the kitchen learning about Food. I'd like to point out this was not actually in the war, was it? it was after no, the war. Not quite that old. Because I do cheeky, remember when we did a, one of your shows, there was AK Souffle and also, I can't remember what the title of the other one was. Look out. Look out. Yes. And I came as a guest as a Mr. Ho Ho Ho. And I remember you saying that uh, you saw me in that particular part when you were whatever, you were now 60-something or other. 66, isn't it? 66. That's, mm. you know, mm. me round my thigh, 66. So I don't mean centimetres. Um, so that was always amusing to think that. But to think back, when did, what year was that you did that 
Almost like an apprenticeship. 74. 74. It was brilliant. I loved it. And I was paid £16 a week. But because we got tips from the guests, I never actually touched that money. That money went in the bank. So you, you kept that So then. when I got to uh, London to go to art school, mm. I actually had some money in the bank and a student grant because that back in the days we got a student grant to go to university and college it was I, I when I got my degree in education yeah I, I, I got it for free and I yeah. look at these poor people these days these poor students leaving with 45 50 thousand pounds debt I'm going to use the word again it's a fucking disgrace yeah it is it's a disgrace uh, then I arrived with with money in my pocket and a passion for food but I'd also learned that I didn't actually want to work in a commercial kitchen no, because um, like I'm thinking myself, I don't want that to become a chore. Yeah. You may have the passion for cooking, but you don't want to actually lose it. Oh, no. And it gets so repetitive. Where you these days, and I've seen your Facebook data, my goodness me, I want to come round every night. <laughs> you know, and it's fantastic. And how you do it is fantastic. I'm the same, but very similar. Yes, you pay sure. Because I remember, nice, I remember yeah. you saying, oh, I can't remember... I think we were out. I don't think we were doing a show. It might have been going out. We probably met for a drink because we've done those a couple of times. Yeah, have we that? Where we were laughing and joking, or before recording, we would actually say something. You look at. I think it was when we did one of the Christmas. We had a couple of ladies there, and Ty Jeffries was there. Like That's Jeffries, right, yes. And you just looked down at your tummy and went, "This is my CV." Absolutely. Which I thought was absolutely wonderful. I'll <laughs> well, tell you what, with my car that wouldn't go round your, your your tummy because my seatbelt's broken. It's um, I've lost a stone in the last. You month. have lost a bit of weight. Yes, I and mean, I've been very careful because in, in lockdown, I think I survived on biscuits and cakes. I made biscuits and I made cakes and I. You haven't got any form of diabetes or anything like no, that. No, no, I'm very lucky. Mm. I mean, I'm fine. I mean, I've got low cholesterol and things like that, which people are amazed by because of my, you know, passion for eating and eating out. Well, I, I think I explained to my director, the lovely Steve, and I said, well, I think, Andrew Kay, one thing you can say about him, apart from being a delicious, funny, witty man and very talented, he's a bit of a bon viveur. Well, and someone once said that I was both. I was, uh, I'd organised an exhibition which went to Dieppe. And in Dieppe, the... Uh, the man, the British man who was introducing me in French, described me as being a bon viveur and a bon vivant. Mm. And they're both slightly different. But one's a lover of um, food and drink and one's a lover of life. But you're I both quite like that. I quite yeah, like yeah, that. you are very much indeed yeah. because I've, uh, you've done so many shows for latest and all that. And previous to that, you know, having left your, your uh, art college work and all that and sort of learnt the trade in commercial kitchens and all that. You moved on to many other things and certainly illustrations and working on books and all that. And of course you've done your telly and all that, but there's, uh, from, from the days back in the day, let's go to the 70s, shall we? 70s, well, 74, I got to, Mum and Dad drove me down to Chelsea and install me at the halls of residence. We don't mean the football club, by the way. We mean the proper no. place. Uh, yes. I, uh, I lived in the halls of residence, which were just over Albert Bridge. Beautiful, beautiful place a beautiful to live. place, isn't it? Uh, with, um, I, you could have had views over Battersea Park. I was on the other side of the building. Were you in a tiny walk? And all with that? A, yeah, I mean, my walk to uh, college every day took me over Albert Bridge and to the right, Cheney Walk. and. Straight ahead, Warfield Street, where at the time David Bowie was and living. Luckily, yeah. And luckily it's all not been knocked down, it's still as it is. It's a lot of it. still. It's yeah, well, still. actually, the sad thing is, Chelsea School of Art has been knocked down. Has that gone? It's gone, and it's near a set of very expensive, I'm going to call them flats. People like to call them apartments, but they're not the flats, aren't they? We're British. Um, and uh, I was very sad. I went there recently, and I thought, oh, I'll go and have a look at the Henry Moore sculpture, and where I spent four years of my life. And... It's gone. Absolutely gone. But there are things that are still there and are still lovely and I love that about going back to Chelsea. And mm. it does feel like a sort of weirdly spiritual home. But then I, I moved, I, yeah, I but moved I find down sometimes here. you go you find times you, you you go to London. I used to have lots of friends in Earl's Court and at the BBC mm. and all that. And you're Earl's Court, you 
It wasn't all just full of Australians, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, back in the day, the 70s. But I tell you what, to me, going back and seeing a lot of it is missing like you have done. Mm. But what's still there is like a piece of elastic that takes you back in time and you go, oh, wow. And then that me memories start pouring back into your mind, which you've obviously forgotten, I've forgotten, and all that. You just need that bit of a kick start to bring them back. Absolutely, and I can remember I was caught going, going I can remember going to the first time to the Colhan oh, cool. and be slightly intimidated by all these leather queens uh, and sidling up to the bar, looking very much like an art student, so not like a leather queen at all. And, I, and it was very leather, wasn't it? It was very leather, and also I looked very young until I was about 25. I you didn't still shave young, yeah. until I was 26. Change your glasses, so silly it was, cow. Uh, it was, but I remember uh, walking past the coal hern, and because my friend Paul Tams, who um, was an illustrator, lived up the road, that's where I stayed weekends, what would happen is you walk past and you get these book, fucking great big butch leather queens, absolutely, God knows how cow's hides have got yeah. into these things. And you just go walk past and go, well, where is she then? That's exactly Campus, what happened to me. Campus tits, were <laughs> they? I walked to the bar and I was trying to buy a drink and I overheard these two guys and he said, oh, he said, thanks for that pat and that cardigan's going to look lovely. And I thought, leather queen, knitting a cardigan. But I did used to go to a, a bar in a club called Harpoon Louis. Harpoon Lewis, that, no, that was up the road. Which was up the road and was really good fun. It was really good, but I had one of the worst nights of my life though when I went with a new... Well, you didn't go in leather. I went with a new boyfriend who I'd been seeing for a little while who was a friend of an ex-boyfriend. And we oh, went dear. in and the ex-boyfriend turned up as well and was not very happy and had a bit of a hissy fit. And to deal with it, I sent Keith home. Keith was lovely and I said, look, Keith, you go home, I'll sort out Peter. So Peter was still, he was drunk and he was ranting. And Peter was always known by everyone as Little Peter because he was very small. And so I said, look. You won't go away. You're, you're too drunk, I'm going to drive you home to Putney and then I'm going home. So we set off and you know the lovely crescent behind mm. Ellsport mm. Road. I'd parked there and I wasn't drinking. I park there. Now, if I walked in, you don't see them anymore, but if I walked into a parking meter, mm -hmm. it would hit me here. Mm -hmm. With Peter, a parking meter hit him here. Mm. So he walked into a parking meter, gashed his head open, blood everywhere. I said, get in the car. So I drove him to an accident and emergency at Hammersmith Hospital. Mm. On a Saturday night, about 11 o'clock. Was it chock block It was chock block but also I think all the nurses were male and gay and they looked at me at six foot two and Peter at five foot five and of course I just looked like the husband beater. <laughs> right. oh, they were all, and they were all so... making a big thing like had I beaten him up and I said he walked into a parking meter it was like it was a horrible night but I did love hopping movies yes. Harpy did I remember I've been the, you, what might have happened but can you imagine we might have been in the same places. I think it's very likely that we've been we've in the same places many same, times. Know, and do you remember the Copacabana, which is on oh, the Earth yes. Court Road? Yeah. yeah. And there uh, are some fantastic restaurants in Earth Court Road, and I had really good... Well, they had the Stock Park. The Stock heard. Park's brilliant. Oh, are you going there? So cheap. And, I mean, it was proper food. Egg mayonnaise, moussaka, apple crumble, hazelnut ice cream. I was yeah. at exactly the For same thing. For about 45p. I think the moussaka was 45p, egg mayonnaise was, I think, 20p, something like that. It was crazy cheap, wasn't it? Mm. It was brilliant. Oh, I loved it, We yeah. loved it. It the was stock, cheaper stock. than the art school see, canteen. Isn't this is a marvellous thing, because we have so much in common, which we've never discussed before. So this is why this sort of show is bloody good. And let's go to your books and all that sort of stuff and the designs and stuff you did and, and to, for many well-known people too. Well, I, I mean, I graduated from Chelsea and I loved it at Chelsea. I did all sorts of fun things, you know, I got a scholarship. I went to Paris to circus school for a short while. That's another story you don't know about. Um, You've got a tennis then. 
Well, I just won this Thames Television Scholarship and I went to circus school and I went to London Circus School for a while, which was fun. And I did clowning. I clowned outside the Pompidou Centre mm -hmm. and I clowned in Berkeley Square once. And great fun. I mean, really good fun. No but nightingale. It wasn't going no to... nightingale, darling. I, I was the nightingale. Yeah. But I knew it wasn't going to be the career for me. Mm. I mean, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't stage struck at all. And then I, I was doing the washing up in this chocolate shop in Knightsbridge and I did it for two, two days, that was all. Got paid cash, bag full of chocolates. I mean, it was a good dive of chocolates, so it was mm. worth its weight in gold, the bag of chocolates. And when I got home to my rooms in Ballam that night, there was a message Ballam. by the phone, about a gateway to the south, there was a message by the phone and it was the name of, one of my tutors was a brilliant typographer called Tim Higgins. And he left a message saying, can you call in the morning? I have some work for you at Weidenfeld and Nicholson. Which I thought was fantastic. So I called him first thing in the morning. He said, you're not far away, are you? Well, Weidenfeld was in Clapham High Street and I was in uh, Barrow. So it was, uh, you know, 10 minutes on the number 88. And I was there, went in and I stayed six years. I absolutely loved it and it, it was, at first I was designing uh, the insides of books as an assistant to other designers and I did that for a little while and I got to work with um, Mark Boxer who was the wonderful cartoonist Mark, there's one of his brilliant drawings on the wall and um, the one of, it's actually of George Weidenfeld and the little drawing of Mark Boxer in the corner and that is Tim Higgins who gave me my first job. Uh, anyway. Mark liked what I was doing, so he asked me if I'd design a book that Tim had worked on initially called The Horse in Art. So I did that. And they had a book designer called Peter Theodosiu, who's a, the loveliest, loveliest young guy. But he'd gone there on a, a, a sort of job experience thing and stayed. Mm. And he was totally intimidated by the things that I had learned and could do. And he said... Was it envy or jealousy no, or just intimidation? No, it was. It, he did the most extraordinary thing. He said, let's go for a drink at lunchtime. Back in the days when we used to go and have a few pints at lunchtime, which I can't believe we did now, but we did. Anyway, that day I went with Peter and we had a drink. We had egg and chips. And he said, I'm going to resign. And I said, why? You've got the most fantastic job. And he said, yes, he said, but I can't do what you do. I've applied to go to art school and I've been offered a place. I'm going to go and learn how to do it properly. He said, when you go back, I will go in and resign and I will suggest that they give you my job. So within the space of a day, I went from being a freelance to being employed by Weidenfeld and Nicholson. Um, I think I earned about £3,823. It was... Not a huge amount of money, but it was a. Was that per year? Or? It was per year. I was going to. Say, it was <laughs> the well, most. Have that per week. I'll be happy now. Let's, let's put it in context. Mm. I was only paying nine pounds a week for my flat, so it was. Yeah. You know, it was decent. It was decent, but it was the most fantastic job. And at that time, Widenfeld and Nicholson were a big name in publishing. Mm. They still are a big name, mm. but they're part of another group now. They're part. Of Orion um, and it was wonderful and I worked with wonderful people I mean uh, some of them have remained friends for life and uh, it was just the best fun and we were mischievous I mean, we got all up to all sorts of nonsense but I got to design books for incredibly big named authors who I never thought I'd be doing I mean I designed I designed biographies I, I, I took John Mills to have his autobiography portrait taken by uh, Lord Litchfield and uh, your old friend Katie Boyle, I did her mm. autobiography uh, with Litchfield again and I worked with some massive you know, uh, names. You know what you always say, Katie Boyle said to me, oh can I? <laughs> and you know how uh, she was the Marchioness? I do, I do In and I'm very, I'm very sad. Katarina. I did have all these books, I had all the first editions and the covers and a lot of them were signed by the authors and I had to move rapidly once and for then, reasons I'm not going to go into. Um, I've forgiven them now. Um, but in most of the books I, 
I'd got them signed, and in some of them I had letters, and I had a beautiful letter from Katie Boyle saying oh, thank you, and how much she loved what I'd done. Uh, one thing, I, I must say, I met Katie, I met Katie through Eurovision, which yes. at the moment, as we know, is now coming back to the UK. Um, that's going to be interesting. Well, it's, I just think at the but moment, this, all this I, I, fuss about this is nonsense. Katie Boyle and I didn't care about Eurovision at all. That was a funny <laughs> thing, is because I met her doing a Eurovision thing back in the day, and she said, Oh, darling, Mark, would you tour past me? Would you like to come join me for the opening of the new area of Bassey Dock's home with Terry Wogan? And I said, oh, love Terry, yeah, and all that. And we had just done a, this morning thing, whatever it was, it's back at 78, no, 90. It would be Good Morning Britain or something. Yeah. yeah, one of those things. Okay. It was Rich and Judy, anyway. And she said, well, do come. I said, well, which is because she had, I've got photographs of her and me and her dogs in the green room at the old London studios, it used mm. to be London weekend. Yes. And we're sitting there, she said, You've got to come with me. I don't want to go on my own. I said, because you may stop me from getting any more dogs. And I said, you may not stop me from getting any dogs. I might need another one. <laughs> and she was a hoot. She was the kindest, nicest woman. So nice. So intelligent. And John Mills was one of the sweetest people I've ever met. I met him at Elstree to show mm. him the visual that I'd done for the book. So I'd done a sketch of what I thought it should look like. And I, I thought, well, it's John Mills, he'll be wearing a blazer with some sort of military insignia on the pocket, and he will have on a sky blue shirt and a cravat. And I painted all this, mm. and the cravat was maroon with little motifs on it, all drawn. Mm. And I took that to Litchfield and said, that's the look I want, the background should be very dark, there should be a beautiful grass green glow behind John's head and so on. And we went along and did it and Mary was there, John's wife, mm -hmm. and uh, it was immaculate what Litchfield and his wonderful assistant, Chalky, did was absolutely capture what I'd done in the drawing. So much so, so that if you put the two side by side... It's like you may have taken it from that photograph. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. It's so, just bizarre. But so they took the concept you had put there and that, was exactly was, what Litchfield wanted yeah, and what John and Mary wanted. Absolutely, as well. and it was just, it was such a fun. Years later, and I mean, you know, five or six years later, I was walking through the West End down that little alleyway that runs between um, Charing Cross Road and St Martin's Lane, where the yeah. bookshops and things are. Yeah. There are lots of stage doors down there. Oh, don't we know, dear? I know. And I've been thrown out a couple of those. So John know. was coming out after doing a performance, and there's a little clutch of fans yeah. there. And I was with a friend, and I said, oh, God, it's, it's a John Mills. I said, I designed his book cover. And I was standing at the back, and he looked over this crowd of lovely ladies of a particular age. Mm. And he went, he said, I know you. You designed the cover for my autobiography. All those years later, mm. and, and, and it was like, yeah, and all these ladies were looking, and uh, it was such fun. And at the same time as doing all those, there was a lot of literary uh, fiction covers, a lot of academic books, and a lot of science-y books, because they had a very strong science list, and picture books, and then we started doing some fun books, and I've been there a few years by this point, so I'm quite well established. And I was doing book covers, but occasionally I'd get hauled in to do food books mm -hmm. because they knew it was my passion. And uh, I even did some recipe testing for the editor who did the food books, which was great. Fun. I was throwing the most lavish dinner parties for a 24-year-old in London because everyone else was making what they call spag bol. And I was doing partridge in a Calvados sauce <laughs> because I was testing recipes for Marks and Spencer's books. Keith Floyd used to do sort of Get the right ingredients. It was good. very yeah. like that. And mm. and I just told that editor I could cook and she said, oh, we'll do some recipe testing for me. So I'd cook it on a Saturday night. I'd have a group of friends around for dinner in my tiny flat in Stratton. And they'd, they'd sit down and they'd get this lavish French meal. Which, mm. you know, I, I mean, I knew what I was doing 
so it was it was great fun and then on Monday I'd go in and say I think the recipe's good except there's too much butter or there's not enough of this and so on and so forth and I loved that anyway doing all these mad things at the same time suddenly I got called into a meeting with one of the editors a lovely lovely man and he he said we've got a major project up for for you and it's going to take you away really from doing the book covers but we need you to carry on doing the book covers but we want you to work with um, Barry Humphreys on a Day Medna book and I was like I was a huge fan anyway and I had to go and have a meeting with Barry because Barry is extraordinary that's the word to describe him mm -hmm. he's extraordinary he's one of them perhaps the most brilliant man I've ever met the mm. brain is incredible and I went to have a meeting with him. what I learned very quickly was that he likes to work with people he likes mm -hmm. if he oh, doesn't yeah. like someone he can't and it wasn't just can't he won't work with right. them and I was very lucky that we hit it off we yeah, had so the he, same to me he always had a sort of team let's get the team right it was about that and he has a very good friend who at that point and I think he's still around was was helping him with the writing a part of it and all of that but it was very much up to me to create the image for the book and I I chose an illustrator to work on the book throughout lovely lovely boy called Daniel another one that I taught actually and um, put together this team I had two different photographers who worked on it for very different reasons because we wanted some to look studio and we wanted to some to look location and mm -hmm. you know and uh, we got on like a house on fire i mean i i looked at the book recently and some of the things that are in the book would not get passed for publication these days they're really really so politically incorrect by contemporary standards don't we know darling and it was, uh, <laughs> and, and Barry's always trodden that very dangerous line. Of course he did, all the time. Uh, you know, his humour is very edgy and, and so on and so forth. And it came out, it was a massive success. And he, he we formed a real friendship. I mean, he would phone me in the middle of the night. And I don't mean, you know, 11 o'clock. He would phone me at four in the morning with yeah. an idea. I'd, I'd answer the I phone and he, it, with Barry and he'd say, yeah. He said, do you think you can get us a couple of really good Shakespearean costumes for tomorrow morning? Because I had this idea of doing this thing about, you know, Dave Edna and Madge Olsop doing a bit of Shakespeare. So I'd have to phone up Berman and Nathan's mm. when they opened, which unfortunately they opened up. They've gone, early. they've gone, yeah. Uh, and, you uh, should be able to go to the Leicester Square, you should be just bang into them. Oh, well, yeah, well that's what I did. Mm. And I had to then get a taxi, take me up to Berman and Nathan's with all the measurements, get these costumes, then get back to the studio so we could do one shot of Edna and Madge in Shakespearean costumes. And that was the original Madge? And that was, no, no, because very she sadly, died, didn't she? very sadly, no, she wasn't dead at that point, she was unavailable, I think she was ill, um, and she eventually ended up in a, a retirement home. So Madge wasn't available. Barry had a very lovely PA, this young girl. He always had dolly girls mm. around him. And this young girl was going to play Madge. But because she was a young girl and not an elderly lady, we had to come up with a, um, a contrived conceit. So it turned out that um, Madge had been experimenting doing her own radical nasolabial facial surgery. Her head was completely bandaged up, so I had to make this bandage mask that she could put on and take off and still breathe. So she had all of the Madge costumes, these awful dowdy things out of um, charity shops, and um, and this awful mask. I mean, there are a few photographs of it. There are photographs of me in the book as well. I know, that, uh, uh, if I remember the big vista, I call it, yes. you're right at the back. No, I'm not. Well, sort of at the No, back. I'm actually right at the front. Are you? And no one, I'm no one, at the front. I'm no one ever works out which one it is. Um, but I'm actually right at the front. I'm Dame Edna's official wombat handler in a bright red boiler suit. And I've got a dustpan and brush. 
and there's a wombat in front of me and a little Is bit of... Is it possible we can get a copy of that? I can show it to you, yes. Now, there's a little bit of wombat poo, and I'm sweeping up the wombat poo, and um, <laughs> the wombat poo, because you have to make all this stuff when you're doing these things, mm. I have to make everything for that book. Mm. So all the all the dummy book covers and video covers in the photographs had to be manufactured mm. because we weren't going to use the real things. So, uh, so on and so forth. Anyway, the, the wombat poo was something called a cow gum rubber. Now, cow gum is something that modern designers do not know about, but it was this toxic rubber solution glue that we used to create the physical artwork for things. And you used it and you had to rub it off. And as you rubbed it off, it formed these horrible cow gum bogies. And we were all very proud of our cow gum rubbers and they got bigger and bigger, but you, you needed one of these things. Anyway, it was just perfect substitute for wombat poo. And much nicer than real wombat poo, I'm sure. Had, um, you, had you ever seen wombat poo? No, of course not. The wombat was stuffed. I mean, we, <laughs> I'd, I'd hired the stuffed wombat. There were so many things that had to be made. I mean, I designed with a friend who was a costume maker Dave Medner's night dress, which was the funnel web uh, negligee 90, mm -hmm. which is beautiful in apricot. The funnel web is a spider. It's a horrible spider. Um, I designed, de designed Dave Medner's bed and had, a, had to make that. I had to cook and prepare all the food for the food photographs in there because we did Dave Medner's food. Um, I had to make a fake wombat um, ham. So that we, back in those days, there was a wonderful women's spa in Floral Street in Covent Garden that men never went to. And we managed to hire it for an hour. And I was one of the only men at that point who had ever been allowed to go in and swim in the pool. And I'm in, you can't see me, but in the photographs of Dame Medna at the pool with this beautiful girl in the background, I'm holding a tray with Dame Medna's spa lunch, which is wombat ham. I did some completely crazy things. Have you got the no. book available? I have. I will dig it out for you. Are we in a show now? now? Yes, of course we are. Yeah. But I also played the part of a Hasidic Jew uh, in bed with Dame Medna, and my friends played a Chinaman in Dame Medna. And these are things you just wouldn't do now, would you? No, you wouldn't. And it had a beautiful boy called Patrick who worked in the post room at Weidenfeld. And I had him in bed with Jamie in there. He was a very beautiful black boy. But I wanted to exaggerate that he was about six foot four. So he had an assistant who was also a very beautiful black boy, not quite as beautiful. So I had Patrick sat up, bolt upright in bed like this. And, the legs and then I had the other black boy under the covers with his legs sticking out. So these Black boy would have been about seven foot six, you know, ludicrous. But we did that. We did all sorts of things. We applied. We asked Harrods if we could go and film in the makeup department at Harrods. Day Medna doing Day Medna makeovers, and Harrods declined. So we did it in Arding and Hobbs in Clapham Junction. They were just delightful, and it was yeah. such fun, and they were so welcoming and nice, and. Um, when we were putting the book together, we did the things that essential things were in the bedroom, and one of which was a chamber pot. And the chamber pot I found was a big old enamel one. And I decided that it would be really nice to put some torn up newspaper in a block with a piece of string tying at the handle. Do you remember back in the old days? Yeah. People would have newspaper in the the old medi medicated. Oh, yeah. Oh, I saw. Oh, yeah. oh, but there was always, you know, you could, there was this emergency torn up newspaper and I tore it up very carefully so the top sheet was a Harrods ad because they refused to let us film that. Um, I mean, it, it Can was, you tell me how long did this, you know, to do the book, how long did it take? I did so many hours over time that when the book was finished and gone to press and I went back to my normal days, mm. I had to go and see the managing director because... It was all unionised in those days. Oh, of course it was. Yeah. And so I was entitled to time and a half off in lieu. There were no overtime payments, you got time off in lieu. And this was on the basis that, you know, if it was coming up to the book fair in Frankfurt, you might put in an extra 10 hours and you'd get 15 hours off. 
I'd done so much work and it was late summer that the managing director had worked out that I would probably not need to go back into the office till February of the next year. How many hours was that? Then? It was it was ludicrous. And I was wake I was working, you know, sixteen hour days. And but it must have knowing you as I know you, Andrew, that was a passion for you to do. It was just bliss. It was great. <laughs> Oh, I'm so pleased to see. Oh, I oh, know. Memories. Take us through it. Well, I'll show you some of the bits because some of them are probably not really appropriate these days, and uh, I wouldn't want to upset people. Let's see if I can find something. Well, there we have. This is Madge in her radical uh, nasolabial surgery head bandage uh, and Edna in the funnel web sat on the bed and these were the videos that Edna had found that Madge was watching and we had to make all these <laughs> so they're called things like spinster, spinster spasms and loins of lesbos and kinky, oh, no. loins, of lesbos. loins of lesbos and kinky convent capers which I had to make all of these mad things. Was that your creation oh, or yes. was it Gary's? Yeah, no, it, was, it was a collaboration all through. And these are people's bedside tables. So, you know, we've got the Edna's bedside table and Madge's bedside table and, you know, absolutely Trace horrible. her then leak your heart out there, darling. It was, uh, well, this is pre-Tracy M doing it. In actual fact, there is somewhere... <gasps> Well, this, this was fun to do. Edna's Fisherman's Facial. And I have to say, what a star the man was, because he did this. From there, I built, basically, the Harrods fish display on, on his face. On oh, that's face. the Harrods thing, yeah. Well, we didn't do it in Harrods. This is a different thing. But I just bought all this fish, and poor old Barry, poor Edna, underneath with all this, and finally, the Mary Rose sauce on the top and the caviar. I mean, it, it was... Does Barry like fish? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. And here we have the, the full dress that we, we made, which is gorgeous. With the wow. full web spider motif at the neck. And, uh, but some of the other things that are in here, let me see if I can go. This is the photograph that most people don't spot. I say them in the book three times. And... We had, this, we had this idea, well I had this idea, that in the, you know, bed bugs and bed wetting and bed sores. And Barry said, how are we going to do it? And I said, well, we'll get, I'll get some doughnuts and cut them in half, ring doughnuts, and I'll fill the middle with something like chutney. So that is a ring doughnut cut in half, filled with chutney to look like a bed sore. For a step, for a step it puts me off doughnuts and chutney immediately because that looks so real. And it really is horrible, isn't it? Uh, and... Then we get to the studio and Barry says, well, I'm not doing it. And the photographer says, well, I'm not doing it. So it was my idea. So it had to be my bottom. In the... Is that your bum? That's my bum, yes. My 24-year-old uh, my bottom. And there we are in the pool at um, the sanctuary in Furrell Street. With Edna in the pool. This is the ham. Oh, it's koala ham, not one. <laughs> koala ham, Vegemite, uh, and a, that is, I think, meant to be some sort of emu egg or cassowary egg. And there's Madge with her bandages on still. And if we had the full picture, you would actually see that you can see I'm holding that. I'm in the water, holding the tray. Mm. Who's that lady with her boobies She was just this lovely girl in the pool who said, yeah, I'll do that. Now, here we are. Ah, so my favourite. You thought I was here, didn't you? But you're there. And that's my friend Kevin. This is me down here, when I still had her, when I still had black her. And uh, this man came from Cartier with half a million pounds worth of diamonds. And he came with it handcuffed to his wrist. But he came on the bus, and that's in the Oliver Messel suite. And all, who are the rest of you? They're people? all my colleagues from work. So all my friends. That Daniel, he's a, he's the illustrator. I like the local villain. Lovely, lovely man here I worked for. Uh, and everyone, some of the girls and some of the editors and 
it was just great fun. Great fun. This is one of one of the senior directors from Weidenfeld. Um, he does look he's got a face like a smacked ass, but I think he was probably he enjoying was meant, He was meant to look like that. I bet he was yeah. enjoying every moment. And the, and the Dorchester were so kind letting us Who's do that. that? Hey, he was one of the editors and he was meant to be... Um, I don't know if I remember what he meant to be. They're all listed. So. The sausage the sausage and uh, mash. Uh, well, that's an interesting concept. Well, this is a marrow stuffed with lobster. Now, at the time of year, there were no marrows, and it wasn't like you can do now and go into a, a specialist shop and say, have you got a marrow? And they say, oh, we can get you one. You couldn't get one. So I have to paint a melon to look a bit more like a marrow. And these pork tr pig's trotters with Roquefort and bananas. And that's, this is amazing, it's a scrambled egg with avocado and chilli sauce, which actually became... Well, people eat it now. Absolutely, absolutely. Great fun. Oh, and there we have... Uh, pineapple fritters stuffed with black pudding served with chocolate chip ice cream and a fabulous uh, banana and sweet corn smoothie all made in my kitchen in um, in Stretton absolutely mad days I promise you the maddest time so Tracy Amid you missed the boat I did it with Madge and Dave Bettner mm -hmm. I, I, and she did much later, didn't she? Oh, much, much later, yeah. Well, I'm trying to find this book, honestly. I can't find it. I, 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 I assume then... Oh, Hello, darling. I assume, darling, that you don't actually go through them in a constant remembrance of things. No, you see, I... I the memory's better, I've isn't it? I got rid of a lot of books. I had so many and I gave them all to a charity. So I mentioned that I'd dressed up as a Hasidic Jew. Uh, here we go. Right. So there I am, Hasidic Jew, in bed with Edna. Which one? Rob Dew South, Rob Dew South, or Alan and Jude Hall? Keep it in, we're loving it. How bizarre is that? What's that got to do with it? And no one touched it, did they? So, it was, that was the ghost of some of these people. They're coming for you, my dear. They're coming for it's you. It's time. Right, stop. Ready? And go. So, we've done me as the Hasidic Jew. This is my friend Mario, uh, uh, who was half Chinese and half Italian. Mm -hmm. His father was Chinese, his mother was Italian. Well, I promise you, Mario was Chinese from the chest up, but he was definitely Italian from the waist down. And this... Excuse me a moment, I may have to have a think about that. This is I do Patrick. like the Mediterranean. <laughs> this is Patrick, the beautiful boy from the poster. I mean, he really was the loveliest, loveliest guy. Uh, he's... I, 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 have I have to be honest with you, Andrew. I do like something of. It's an awful thing to say, probably I'm told off, you know. I like a bit of tint. He and of course, my husband is Costa Rican. He's he got is, a bit of yeah. But my God. And this is the situation. Well, this is the, this is the two boys from the post room. Who, in those days. From the post room! They were lovely. They were just so lovely. Well, the great thing for them was they had a, a morning out of the office. Having fun, you know, with cakes and tea and a, and meeting Edna, which was so, uh, and this was Edna as Edna the as whole Edna, way through. Yeah, absolutely. It was. I'd love to have heard what uh, Edna said to these boys and girls. Oh, oh, and oh, outrageous! Right, absolutely outrageous. I mean, that's the day matches waters broke. Now, this photograph. There were two photographs that I had put together to make this. Back in the days before computers, and I used to do all the retouching was done by a brilliant man called Terry Boxall. Terry was the senior um, retoucher at Vogue. All right. And he was a genius. Okay. And I loved him dearly. And once a year, he would take me out for lunch to the Burnie Inn. Oh, and uh, so that is not particularly real. That's what's put into it. So the, no, this is real. And that is real. The flood is real. I'm just. How do how do they do the flood? I found the photograph. I mean, it's just a nice thing we did. We did all these mad things, you know. Went to a, a spa and put Edna in a sunbed and in a steam cabinet and in a hammock with a cocktail. Reading Woman's Weekly, <laughs> of course. This is on a on a Singapore Airlines flight. This was the first airplane that had beds, sleeperettes, 
Oh yeah, we went yeah, yeah, with this. yeah. And then afterwards, we went and had lunch in a hotel close to uh, Heathrow, and it was German food day. So we had all these mad food, and Barry, of course, couldn't get out of costume because we were going from doing this to doing Alding and Hobbs. So we had to go in as Barry. So uh, and he, he was very naughty. I mean, he was standing at the buffet farting away, and. Um, the manager came through and he said, is there any chance to me, is there any chance I can have a photograph with Damien and the staff for on the wall of the hotel? And I said, well, I'll have to ask Barry. And so he came over and he said, um, Damien, uh, the manager would like to know if you'd do a photograph with all the staff, the hotel records and on the wall. And uh, Damien said, of course, darling. She said, there won't, of course, be a bill for lunch, will there? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know. It was, it was a joy. It, it really mm. was a joy, and of course that that um, that was the show he'd been doing at the Piccadilly Theatre, and then we got Bondage Edna, and I have to, I, I want to just say something about my brilliant and sadly died very young illustrator Daniel, and Daniel could imitate all these styles. He did a, such a wonderful Where job. Is that? Bonded with that's on the next page. Oh, now here we are. It's a disgrace. Daniel was a Chelsea School of Art student, a really good friend, a very talented young man, and he died in his 20s. He went to see another art director and had a heart attack in their office and died. And it was awful, it was heartbreaking because he was. These are all pastiche drawings that he did for me for this. I mean, look at this. It's all. This is Kenny and his friends. Kenny is uh, Edna's son. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. You know, lovely. And there we are, fairies and fairies. And Edna in bondage gear. I mean, it was. No, no. <laughs> yes, I know. The, 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 the great thing can, was. Can we just keep that there, just in case I want to vomit? The great thing about Barry Humphreys is if you have an idea and you put the he'll, idea to him he'll go. and he likes the idea, he will take it to the nth degree. He will do it. Well, it, like when he appeared on things like Parkinson or oh, that, yes. I mean, he Barry would Humphreys. never shy away from anything. He was just, he was just wonderful. A very, very dear man. Very dear man. I think we had mad things as well. George Weidenfeld went on holiday for part of it and I needed a car to trundle us around from all these locations mm. and and it was decided that George had a chauffeur and he had this beautiful white Mercedes mm -hmm. and so I had the chauffeur in the white Mercedes he would come and pick me up in Streatham from my tiny little flat and drive me over and we'd pick up Barry um, or it was Barry when he was out of costume in costume it's Dave Edna of course it is. and I had to come to an arrangement with Barry because you can't art direct Edna. You know, you, you literally have Ed, Edna is in control. So when he's Edna, and I had to say, I'm going to have to be able to come and talk to you as Barry on set. And he was he, he was very obliging and saying, we're the first morning in the studio, was hell. I mean, we didn't get anything done because I would, oh, Barry, can you just move slightly to the left? And Edna would reply. <laughs> it was nuts. The most wicked thing we did uh, as Edna, we were on the book tour, the author tour, mm -hmm. and we booked. What together. year was that? Then? About nineteen seventy-eight, I think. She did. She already. No, no, it would be, no, it'd be about nineteen eighty. But by that time, she was doing tennis, hadn't she? And oh, she, oh, be huge. And she'd I mean, done she'd, the sound of Edna. She'd done this big season at Drury Lane. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was going to Drury Lane uh, quite a lot. Uh, and Barry would send me out to have a look at the audience as it arrived and then I would go back and say there's a woman in row G, three <laughs> seats in, with a surgical collar on and that would be his mark for the evening. Oh, which so he I'd, did on many shows. Yeah, after and, I would, uh, and he, would, he would say, oh pop out, go and have a look, is there anyone looks peculiar in the audience? That was, that was great. But the author tour I mean, there was no real reason for me to be on the author tour. I was an art director, not, not a publicity person. But Barry decided that he would like me on the author tour with him. 
So we got booked to go to do uh, Birmingham City Radio, whatever that was called, which we did in the morning, it was fun. And oh, that was on the second day. The first day, we took the train up and we had this lovely, lovely publicity girl called Louise. She's a really lovely woman and we're still friends, although I don't know why, because of this trick that we played. So, Pebble Mill, I... Big it was big. It was a huge show. Oh, at the time. yeah. Massive. I worked there. And I had to speak, speak to the producer and he said, you know, what are you going to do? And I said, well, who else is on? So they've got a load of people from a women's institute doing something about knitting. And I said, OK, we'll do something about that. But Barry and I sat down and we thought, you know, we should have some fun with this. So... <laughs> I went round a load of junk shops, I mean the proper junk shops in those days, not mm -hmm. charity shops, junk shops, and I bought an old vanity case. Do you remember when ladies had mm. a vanity case with the mm. makeup in? And I bought one of those and it had a load of dead old makeup in it and I found some more old makeup and we piled it all in. And I had it covered up and on the train up to Birmingham, Louise said, so is everything prepared? Have you got everything sorted for the show? And I said, yes. And then she said to Barry, what are we doing? What are we doing? He said, oh, we're doing this fantastic story about how Dame Maidner has just come back from Monaco and the reading of Princess Grace's will, in which Princess Grace left her entire collection of lipstick to Dame Edna. <laughs> well, it was only a few, a no, month or so. That back. is genius. It was a month or so after Princess Grace had passed. Yeah, but that is genius, isn't it? And I'd made this horrible thing and I revealed it with all this stinking old lipstick in it and mascara, back from the days when people used to spit on their mascara wand. Yeah. Yeah. Old bit of lunch, no? Yeah. Five and nine down or no? Yeah. It was just hideous. Anyway, this is, this is going back to the early 80s, so no mobile phones, no laptops. No phone on the train. Mm. And we're trundling out of Euston to Hawks, Birmingham, and Louise has gone into meltdown that we've planned this terrible, terrible, tasteless piece for, for lunchtime, for midday well, we're television. Pe 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 at one. Yeah. Of course, we hadn't. I had made some giant knitting needles, and I'd made a giant. Remember, people had a knitting bag with a wooden handle. And I bought the wooden handle, I made this gigantic knitting bag, which had poinsettias all over it, which are sort of indigenous to Australia, so it was all there. And we weren't bloody hell, I think. No, we didn't, we didn't have that. <laughs> I couldn't find bloody hell, but I could find poinsettias because it was in the Christmas section of the fabric shop. Anyway, Edna had got this brilliant knitted costume with a koala on the front, so I just knitted the needles onto the, onto the dress. So it looked like Edna was, so she could pull out the dress with the knitting needles and have the koala. So it was all there. Oh, Louise okay. is going mental. We get to Birmingham and she dashes off the train and she dashes through the ticket barrier and looking for a phone. And she's on the phone, phoning this producer. I'm really sorry, I'm not sure you're going to want to do this. Our art director has done this terrible thing with Barry and oh, it's really tasteless and so on. She didn't know we not we weren't going to do that at all. But the producer was in on the gag, so he knew that we were doing the knitting thing. Mm. I told him we were doing the knitting thing. She's in meltdown. We've got cars being sent to meet us at the station. Off we go, and she's she's dashing into Pebble Mill, and she's sweating, and of course. We didn't tell her anything until we went on the set and she's got this knitting bag, ed has got the knitting bag and reveals the thing. And uh, Louise's face was like, you bastard. <laughs> so she has forgiven me. Yeah, but that was live in those days, wasn't it? Oh, it was live, yeah. Yeah, it you had to go on. Uh, uh, I think they, uh, what they call it, uh, I think they still do it now. Is it a minute moratorium between transmission and I, I think there's a slight delay, but yeah. not very much. But there wasn't much in those no, days, because it had no. to go out. It went out live. Uh, and of course, I'm in fits at the back of the studio. I mean, just roaring, laughing. Of course, if someone did that to me now, I'm on the other side of the bloody camera, I'd be furious. And of course she was really cross. It just goes to show, doesn't it, really? Yeah. But um, you, you won't believe what's going to happen next. <laughs> <laughs> the, 
that night, Barry took us out to a very smart restaurant to apologise to her for the meanness. No, I, I met Barry Humphreys as Barry mm. a couple of occasions. Delight, very funny, witty, witty man. Mm. Um, and I had a friend in Wardour Street, who, uh, and I can't remember his name, I think his name was James in Wardour Street, who was something to do with uh, film, I think it was. And he, uh, Barry Humphreys turned up, I think it was uh, after Sound of Edna, it was one of those after that. Uh, and he said, oh, you, um, Mark, I've got a surprise for you. And who walks is Barry Humphreys. He was so lovely and I was very lucky. I, I saw him in Brighton a few years ago and went back and we had a lovely time and a chat. And he'd, well, I mean, Barry doesn't drink, mm. but he'd got champagne there because I was visiting, which was lovely. Mm. And then this year, He's been touring a show of his own as Barry. I know. And I went to Eastbourne to see it and I sent a card. And I said, I'm going to be in the audience. I know it's going to be late. And if you're travelling back to London or just very tired, then please don't worry. But I would love to see you. And I went to the stage door and there were crowds of people waiting for autographs. And his assistant came out and she said, is there a Mr Andrew Kay here? And she said, Mr Humphreys will see you now. And I was with a really good friend and we went through and spent half an hour with him. And it was he was like, an extraordinary After man. he'd done this very long, very demanding show and he was just so lovely. Mm. And it was like we hadn't been part and he was telling people as we went past, you know, what I'd done and mm. how I'd done the book and so It was great. It was really mm. fun. And a few years later I moved to another publishing house where they were doing Dame Edna's autobiography and he's on the cover for that. So we've had this sort of continuous contact. I think I've got a copy of that. Yeah, it's a lovely it's photograph. It's pink. That. It's pink. It's pink. I've got a copy. Yeah, I've got two copies of it. So I did. I mean, I worked on some fun books. I worked on the. Um, now you're of the right age to remember. Henry Root's letters. They were fictional letters written to famous people by a fi I have fictional. Got the first edition and I've got a letter from Henry Root. I've got about five in there. And I, 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 I looked, they were hilarious. Well it was a wonderful book to work on, it was great fun and I did the covers and I won awards for those covers. <coughs> Which at the time, I mean winning awards for design was just so prestigious and I won. Would you, would you like to just say to the people what Henry Root really was? Henry Root was a, a wonderful band called Willie Donaldson and Willie, he was a bit of a rascal. Um, mm -hmm. I think he, he ran a very smart brothel in Sloan Street or just off Sloan Street in Chelsea and he came up with this daft idea that he would write as a wet fish salesman, Henry Root, to famous people including Colonel Gaddafi Which and... Which has a cover. It's got a wet fish on it. It has got a wet fish on it. That's me. That's my work. Well, it's not um, you being the wet fish, darling. No, it's not. Um, it's like a herring to me. It was a mackerel. And, um, a mackerel, there we go. <laughs> uh, and I had to photograph all the letters and come up with the concept of how they would be shown in the book. And there was no text in the book, just the letters and the replies. But he wrote to Margaret Thatcher and he wrote to the chairman of the Conservative Party, putting a fiver in as a bride. And, and you put it in, you know, here's a pound. And, uh, yeah. You know, I mean, it was it was hilarious. outrageous. So I did Henry Root one, Henry Root two. I've got both. And I did Henry Root's World of Knowledge. I didn't well, get that one. Uh, which was great fun. Uh, but he was wonderful fun. Did you meet him? Oh God, yes, yeah. yeah many because times. I never saw him because it was a bit like. You well, know. It, he didn't ever appear as Henry Root because Henry Root was a, a fiction, you know. It, it was great. I mean, it was like a best I just had, because I was time. working at the BBC at the time, doing a fuck knows what, I was probably Doctor Who, something like that. And I just said, so there was something going on, I just, I just read your first book and all that, and I said something, we're doing a, a programme or whatever and all that, and he was listing down on the um, letter note paper. You know, I'd like to meet immediately, where was the costumes, like all the ladies, it was going on and on. But I don't particularly want to meet you. So like that, unless you're going to be absolutely hilarious, do take a fiver, and I you put a fiver, and I sent it back. <laughs> he was brilliant. He was a, very. That uh, book was a, a huge, huge, huge success. success. Yeah, and I bet you uh, can't get. Can you get them there? Well, there's lots of paperback editions on um, 
websites that you can buy. Um, I think all sadly, mine. I think I'll find all mine are hardback. The oh yes, oh, and that's one of the other things about my career in publishing. I designed hardback books. I didn't design paperbacks. Mm. I did a few paperbacks when I got to work at Victor Glantz. Mm. Um, because I moved, I worked at four major publishing houses. So the first one was Weidenfell, which is the Dame Medley Years and uh, Henry Root Letters. Uh, and then I worked at Collins. Uh, I wanted to go and work for a company that did very commercial fiction. Weidenfell's fiction list was quite upmarket. Although I did, I did design a book about Princess Margaret and got to go and meet her at Kensington Palace. That's another funny story. Because uh, when we turned up, we were told we'd have to go away and go back because Princess Margaret was feeling delayed or not had a headache or something. But it turned out it was the day after um, Mike Count Linley's 21st birthday party, so I think well, a bit of a yeah, hangover. Yeah. And uh, this was at the same time as I was doing the Day Medna book, and I'd got an advanced copy of the Day Medna. And the author of the book is a very well-known uh, royal biographer, Christopher Warwick. Mm -hmm. And Christopher and I uh, were good friends. Uh, and I, he, it was Christopher that arranged me to go and meet the princess. He said she does like a gift. So I thought, I'll get Barry to sign one of the books book. and take it for us. So I went, we went in eventually at half past six. Tea was off, but gin and tonics were on. And she was sitting on the floor in a green Chanel suit, actually sitting on the floor playing Wagner on a dance set record player. And I always thought it was very funny that a princess... Did you have a bag on at the same had, time? Yeah, of course. I, I thought it was very funny that the princess had a dance set record player when she probably could have afforded a bag and Olufsen. Yeah. But she had this yeah. tatty old record player and she was playing Wagner. And she said, oh, this, 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 and she stood up and Christopher introduced me and I dotted and this is lovely to meet you, Bob. And I, I brought you a gift and I handed over the day made the book. They did this And she went, Oh, she said, Have you been working with Day Med? And I said, Yes, for the last six months. She said, How awful. <laughs> and then I was So Andrew, oh, pretty boys, all in a row. Now look at that. That's, that. Is that you? That's me. That's who me. Are you, oh, who's all these boys? Well, I'd, I'd been writing for the magazine. I'd written a couple of fiction things in the magazine. There was a series in the magazine for a while called Bricks and Mortar about a plumber. Uh, which I wrote anonymously. Everyone at the magazine wanted this sort of serial, funny mm. serial at the back of the magazine every week. So I sent it in anonymously and they loved it. So we ran it and ran it and ran it and then one day I confessed that it was me sending it in. And uh, I sort of discovered that I, I really enjoyed writing funny dialogue. Mm. And Got to a point I'd been I'd been with the same partner for about ten years and it, things had started to fall apart and rather than having to make polite conversation in the evening in our house out in Soldade, I picked up my laptop and I started hammering in the start of a novel. Um, and I was really enjoying it. I'd written about eight thousand words and I'm very lucky because I worked in publishing to have a lot of friends who were authors, and one of whom is very famous author Peter James. Oh well. In fact the painting on the wall there is the cover for Peter's first very big best-selling book which, and it's a, I mean, it's a really wonderful painting. Uh, I love it and I know Peter is very jealous that I own it and he doesn't. Anyway I, I was speaking to Peter on the phone and I said look I've been writing a novel and I know as a famous author you must be so tired of your friends and strangers saying, could you read my novel? Can you give me some advice? I said, but it's only 8,000 words. It's only going to take you an hour to read it. So, you know. And so he said, email it to me. So he, I emailed him the start of this. It wasn't called this at the beginning. It was called something else, which I can't remember. And he wrote back 
the next day an email. He said, I'm going to introduce you to my friend who has a publishing house called Book Guild and she's a lovely lady and uh, I want you to meet her and show her this. So I sent her, uh, by this point I'd written about 15,000 words and I sent it to her. And I didn't hear anything for a couple of weeks. I mean, you don't expect to hear back from publishers. I mean, having worked in the business for 16 years, there's always a room called the slush pile, stacked floor to ceiling mm. with oh. mountains of manuscripts. You know, I mean, it doesn't exist in the same way now because everyone uses computers. But back then it would be, you know, I mean, you'd put a match to it, it'd be the fire of London all over again. Uh, Any, another pudding lane. Another pudding lane. Anyway, a few weeks later, she called me and she said, oh, would you like to come for lunch? And I said, yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. Carol, for that, you know. And so I went and met her for lunch in Brighton and we had a lovely lunch and we didn't talk about the book at all. We just ate and chatted about life in general and publishing and my background in publishing and so on and so forth. And at the end, she said, are you not going to ask about your book? And I said, oh, well, I, I just sort of, you know, I only sent it in on the... You know, and, you know, you're an ego. I, I was like, you know, I, I perfectly understand if it's not. She said, oh, no, she said, we'd like to publish it. And she gave me an envelope with a cheque. And I was then, I knew how it worked because publishers pay in three instalments contract, delivery, publication. So I had the first, first third of my payment for Pretty Boys All in a Row. I'm not going to get a copy because at the end of the day he won't sign it. He's not going to get a copy because he says he doesn't read. And he's missing out because it's got some, it's saucy. Only joke. It's not right filthy, there. it's not filthy, it's saucy. Wow. Um, there's, a, there's a great moment because uh, mum and dad were very proud that I had book published. And so were all my publishing friends. They were all mm. um, staggered that I had written a book in the first place and staggered that I'd had it published. Um, but a lot of them were very kind. You have done so much in the past. Oh, I was moving on again, wasn't I? Uh, anyway, Mum was thrilled. And as soon as I got an advanced copy, I sent it to her and she read it. But in the meantime, she's in a, she was at that time in a book club in Taunton and all the ladies in the book club were ladies of a certain age and rather posh. She gets her advanced copy, reads it, and realises that it's quite saucy. Why didn't you tell me you're safe? Very old words are not going to lie like this. All those ladies, and they've all gone to Waterstones and they've pre ordered it and they're all going to read it. And you know, I mean, I had a bestseller in Taunton. Um, <laughs> and that was the side. It was the only place. Um, anyway, I went home to see mum and dad, and one of the ladies was a very lovely, very elderly lady. She drove around in a great big grey woolsey. Uh, she was 90-something at the time, and she lived in the big house. And I bumped into her in the courtyard at the back of the big house. And she went, oh, hello, dear. Oh, I said, hello, how are you? She said, so enjoyed your book. And I said, oh, thank you, that's really kind. Uh, Mum was a bit worried that it was a bit, you know, racy. And she said, oh, silly woman. She said, anyone would think none of us had ever fucked. <laughs> and I thought... Actually, that was the best quote I got for the book, was the fact that actually I think modern generations have absolutely no concept of the fact we've all done it and we've all done it before you. You know, so get a life. We didn't grow up in uh, tissue uh, paper. Put it this way, Andrew, we? my dear friend. When was the, I can't say it. I'm going to, I will say to myself, when was the last time you fucked, Mark? I can't remember. <laughs> You know, I've got a gorgeous, have a nice day. My husband's got, isn't he? He's beautiful. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. He's beautiful. I, I know he is. All right, all right. He, I'll tell you what he's telling me out for dinner next week. Do you want to come? Maybe. <laughs> I'd love to meet him. I would love to meet him. Yes. Well, he, um, uh, Stephen, has said to me, oh, give me your wedding DVD. You've got that now, haven't you? Pump knows what I'm going to do with that. <laughs> Make a comedy out yeah, of it. So anyway, that's that's how I became a writer, a proper bona fide writer. And um, I've gone on from that. I've written some more fiction, which actually isn't published. Did uh, you just pass window? No, it's the no, chair. I'm trying to that chair. It's the chair. Um, 
And then I was at work one day and I got an email from Worthing Theatres oh. announcing that they were going to have a competition called WOW, Wild on Worthing, a literary festival with a new drama uh, project. So I thought, ooh, that's interesting. Is that quite like, well, I'd started writing a play at that point. And I said, I phoned up my contact there, who I knew, and I said, look, I'm pressed, so would it be inappropriate for me to enter the competition? Oh, no, absolutely. So I sent off my play, and it went through the whole judging process, and uh, and she phoned me up, and she said, uh, are you sitting down? Mm. Um, you've been selected. So my first play, which is called I Will Survive, was... Do they, do they need actors? Um... There is a part, actually, and it's been done this oh, a few years ago. Oh, fuck I'm not asking for a part, I'm just saying. No, you'd be very good as the vicar. Um, Dearly beloved, we have gathered here well, he's a retired, he's a retired. The whole premise is that it's all set in a hospice, and the main character is oh, a, one of those. a lady called Elizabeth, and she's basically... We do understand she's me in your situation, but we try so hard. Look off. Oh, well, actually, no, this figure is actually in the next room and he's cocking it as well. So, <laughs> he's a very confused man. But it's well, I know about it was that. Great fun. I'll, I'll pay more fucking because you don't do. I mean, I give me imagine. back all gas and gators, darling. I know what it's all about. <laughs> oh, good, blue. It's so easy to play a vicar. Did I play a vicar with you once? Well, a priest recently, yeah. <laughs> Did I? Uh, well, I hope I had a bra and link. <laughs> Mm. Uh, so uh, uh, that was done in Worthing, staged, and uh, it was very exciting. Is it? Has it been done now? Uh, fingers crossed. I am actually in discussions about it being done again. Right. Uh, and then I went on to write something. I went to see a good friend, uh, the drag artist and actor Miss Jason, Jason's son. Lovely. And I've seen him do, let's call it straight theatre. He's not been well recently. No, he's actually fine at the moment. He's, he's, he's a wonderful character. And I saw him in something and he was really good and I thought, I'd like to write something for him. Mm -hmm. So I went home and I wrote it. And then I, I messaged him, emailed him and had a chat. I said, would you be offended if I sent you a script? So I sent him the script. And he called me back about an hour and a half later, having read it. It's only 50 minutes. He called me back and he said, I really love it. Can we talk to my friend Alan Cardew? Because he'd love to direct um. it. And um, it's called Morning Glory, because mm -hmm. I quite like a saucy title. And um, we did it, it's nearly three years ago now, but we I did know. it first. Uh, it was rehearsed in Brighton, the first performance was at the Two Brewers in uh, Clapham High Street, a gay mm -hmm. bar in Clapham High Street, which was fantastic and they were incredibly supportive and it was just for the one night and it sold well and it looked beautiful and Jason did a great job and we stayed behind and talked to the audience and wonderfully the audience was very young gay men and women yeah. and older gay men. There weren't any older gay women. Um, no, but we had they, were, they were probably dead. Yeah. Anyway, they, they, it was lovely, and we talked about it because the play is about ageism on the gay scene and how a, a oh, lot right. of younger gay people are unaware, unaware of actually what we were talking about earlier. The, our days back in Earl's Court at the mm. Paul Horn and you know, up in Lewis and and so on, um, and they they were just so responsive. It was mm. fantastic. And then I was uh, I was working on a project. I work in s school projects with young um, youngsters who are identifying as not being heteronormative, so they can be all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing projects with them, making their own TV shows. And I was sat outside one of the schools, Long Hill, a uh, wonderful place, wonderful people are working there with these kids. And my phone rang, and it was Jason. He said, "Are you sitting down, dear?" And I said, I'm sat in a car, and I said, what's that? And he said, the play's booked into the Edinburgh Fringe. Mm -hmm. So we took it to Edinburgh for a week, and it was joyous. And cleverly, Jason and Alan had booked it into a venue in the gay bit of the city, and 
we got really good audiences and great responses. It was lovely. That's what I always say to people, I say, well, how was the business? Well, you know, at the yeah, fringe, you're always talking about getting one or two people at the audience. No, uh, Anna, what I say, you know, I enjoy that because I know about it. Mm. There are several people I know who put on a show. It's always like summer holiday. Let's put on a show. I always say to them, and I've been in the business a long time, and I say, how was business? Mm. And they can have one person. And I said, mm. well, what's the point of doing it? Yeah, yeah. That is my point. If you've got something creative... Ability. I think I think what what it was that the story touched people. I think they. So you're going to bring it right. Recognise. Well, I'm in discussion at the moment to revive it this autumn, but also I've now got the go ahead to film it for television. So Jason is going to revive the part. It's very. It's a very. It's about a very ordinary man who happens to be gay. I have to say. After a wonderful afternoon, my dear friend Andrew Kay and Willow, who has been beautiful to me, uh, and he's got his presence. But I, can I tell you something about Andrew Kay? Delightful, spontaneous, witty, funny, and got more history than I've got up my ass. <laughs> if you know what I mean. But thank you again, Andrew, for it's being and taking us into your home. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for coming. Can we come back again? Of course you can. You can come back any time. Yes, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. It's been lovely meeting mm. you. So that's from us. Thank mm -hmm. you.